Hey guys, I uh, got a great video for you guys today. I think all my videos are great, but I got a cool video. So I went ahead and rebuilt my desk, my gaming desk, and I'm going to show you guys how I did that today. So this video is not like a how-to or, yeah, it's, it's not how-to. It's me showing you how I like DIY uh, a desk design. You can hear Gumbo coming in the room here. Um, so it's kind of a long video. There's lots of me just kind of talking you through decisions I made, what I did, how I did it. Uh, tips, tricks, advice for you to use if you decide to do something similar, but not at all a how-to or this is what you should do. Just things I've learned, challenges I've encountered, things like that. So if you want to skip all of that, which is the meat and potatoes of this video, then I'll throw a link up and you guys can click that and just skip to the end to see the end result. But Hope you enjoy, and uh, that's all I got, so let's get right into it. What's up, everybody? Uh, time for a new project. Today we're gonna be building another desk. Um, I know I just got one put together two years ago when I moved to Alabama, but now that we're here in Kansas, I, uh, I want something different, a little bit more artistic, um, and then much neater. Right now, the way I have my desk positioned, it just is kind of a mess with all the wires. I'll go ahead and put a picture up here. And uh, it's time to, to start something new. So let's check out what we got to get started with. So the main support system for my desk is gonna be a four by four post that's 30 inches long. I'll put some blueprints up soon uh, so you can see kind of what I've created. And uh, I got a new tool today, um, found it on Facebook Marketplace and then the stand from Home Depot. Uh, it's a 10 inch Ryobi miter saw. I definitely wanted a 12 inch DeWalt miter saw, but that's like $700 and this one was 140. So for now it'll be plenty and uh, I'm hoping there's no regrets there. But um, the reason I bought it was I tried cutting a, a 30 inch leg, two of them, and I got one perfect with a circular saw. Um, couldn't really figure out my busted old table saw here. Um, so I did it with a circular saw, but the problem with that, uh, pretty much any circular saw you're gonna have, because that's a seven and a quarter inch, I believe, maybe even a 10 inch. It's a pretty large blade and uh, it just won't cut all the way through a four by four. I uh, in one go. So you kind of have to rotate it and start again. And I just kind of kept shaving an, an eighth of an inch off at a time, getting one side uneven, the other. And then I tried to line them both up and make them. And, and yeah, sure, maybe eventually they got even, but now they're about uh, 29 and 0.75 inches or something like that. Not 30. And I need it to be level because all my other cuts of these two by fours here are going to be based off of that. So cue the miter saw. Hopefully it works. Let's find out. All right, so as you can see, I kind of got everything lined up here with the table saw powered off. And so you just want to make sure that it lines up on the inside edge of your cut there. And I'm only making this cut to make sure I've got a square end, especially since this end of this four by four is kind of ate up and it won't really look good for the final project. It would take a lot of time to work out. So I'm just going to square cut here and then we'll cut our first 30 inch piece. All right, so if you can see here, it's not exactly perfectly square and that's really due to this being such a long four by four and it being bowed because almost any piece of lumber you're gonna buy, especially from like a Home Depot or something like that is gonna be bowed. So if you can really see here, it's got that little bit of gap and that's gonna cause the bow. So I'm gonna actually cut a 31 inch piece here and then um, I'm going to use the 30 inch piece to square off and, and cut that extra inch off. All right, so I got nice uh, straight edge, 30 inch cuts here. And then we're gonna move to our two by fours now. So same process, I'll cut uh, just an inch above what I need so that I can shave off and make a straight edge. We've got eight foot long two by fours and an eight foot long two by two for part of the process here. So we need four 18 inch two by fours and then two 30 inch two by fours and the two by two is a varying length. So let's get those cut. All right, and just to show you guys why I'm cutting that extra inch so that I can square both ends, like that's a square in there is you just line up your triangle and then you can see how it's aligned down at the bottom here and then towards the top, you've got about an extra eighth of an inch maybe. Um, and that seems like nothing. And that's just the factory cut, right? Like that's what you're gonna pick it up from the lumber store with. And uh, it seems like nothing, but when you're trying to get things square, especially if something's gonna sit on the ground, um, that eighth of an inch is just gonna kind of make everything you know, off and it'll wobble. And so you can't completely mitigate that maybe unless you're like a master woodcrafter, I don't know, I'm not. But squaring up those edges will help a lot. All right, so a trick I like to do, um, don't worry about the kind of junk on the edges though. We're gonna sand each one of these pieces of wood before we assemble anything. But uh, anyways, some of the cuts won't come out uh, all perfect, especially if you don't, it's almost like shooting a gun. Like you gotta keep the same sight picture every time when you make a cut or it'll be a little different. So sometimes you do different things. So on two pieces of wood, they're pretty much exactly the same length. And then these two are about an eighth of an inch, maybe a little bit less, shorter. and. Uh, 
Would that make a big difference? Probably not. However, um, what I like to do is I line the two up, so a one and a one, and then a two and a two, since I need two for each side, and uh, those will go together, and it'll just kind of square it up in the end. All right, so now that we've got our pieces cut, you'll only see one 30 by, or uh, four by four, that's 30 inches there, because that's all I need for one side of the desk. The other one I just pre-cut for the next side, but um, let's go ahead and try to kind of dry fit it. Um, it's not gonna work very well, because the pieces aren't super sanded, but it'll give us a general idea of if the cuts are good enough and gonna be square enough. So use some clamps and just kind of put it together like a puzzle. All right, so this is why you run that dry fit. Uh, like I said, it's not perfect, but it's generally square in the bottom here. And if you look, um, you can see that I've got probably half an inch uh, too much on one of the, the cuts. So that's an easy fix, but the dry fit points that out and we can cut it and go from there. All right, now that we've got each piece cut for the right side of the desk, what we're gonna do, since a lot of lumber you're gonna get <clears throat> is like framing lumber or something for construction and houses. So you can see it's pretty pretty beat up. Uh, we won't get all of that out, uh, but we'll get a lot of it out and, and smooth a whole lot of it out. So I'm gonna get with an orbital sander and probably 120 grit sandpaper and uh, just smooth all this out uh, so that it's a little bit easier. Get rid of these nasty edges that you can see around the side too. So uh, that'll take a while, let's get after it. All right, and I'm doing a lot of new things on this build that I've never really done with woodworking before. And uh, one, I've realized that I'm not a perfectionist or a master woodworker. Probably already said that, but uh, things aren't gonna be super precise. So I've never used a pocket hole jig before to, to do uh, pocket hole screws, but I picked one up, about 40 bucks for the kit, really cool, gives you a bit, and then a actual, uh, like, I'm gonna get it wrong, but I'll show you later. Um, anyways, and so I'll kind of show you how that works and what we're doing it for. And then I've never used a miter saw before. Um, I might have used one once, but definitely never owned one or used one for more than one or two cuts. So uh, really happy with the miter saw, though. I've been wanting one for five ever. Um, and yeah, so what I've done after I've sanded all the pieces here, uh, I'm going to go ahead and pre-drill the pocket hole screw jig. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm just kind of rambling on. So let's just see how it ends up. All right, so we're out here day two. Uh, kind of big jump in progress here. I uh, had this design in mind the whole time, this kind of angled zigzag, kind of fill in the, uh, the uh, blank space there, the white space. So the reason I didn't show you uh, those as I was making them was because I was still trying to figure them out. They're not exactly perfect and the angles were giving me a lot of trouble. Um, so I'm gonna show you how to do that real quick now that I've figured it out. So um, what we need to understand is that we've got, uh, see this is four inches, that's two inches, so this is 24 inches on the inside here, according to my blueprints, my schematics, and then on the width, you wanna call it, um, we'll do 18 inches. So it's an 18 by 24 space, and so if we cut each board here at a degree of 22.5, it should line up and meet in this corner. Now, my boards aren't perfect. Uh, this is definitely when I was still trying to figure it out, so hopefully side two will be a little bit better. But uh, as I've said many times now, Definitely not a master wood worker, so we're just gonna go with sort of perfect. Um, all right, so this is what you do. So you take your miter saw, your chop saw, whatever you're using, you angle it to 22.5 degrees. Mine's real nice and it's got a red line right on it already. So 22.5 degrees, make one cut, and then you just slide the board over. So don't flip it, don't rotate it, anything like that. You want the uh, kind of slope of the cut to be up, um, opposing, uh, if that makes sense. It doesn't want to look like a, uh, what's that thing called? I'll put it on the screen now, because I, a trapezoid? Yeah, trapezoid, you don't want it to look like a trapezoid. Anyways, so you just slide your piece over, and then since mine's 18 on the width, we're gonna cut a 19 inch board. So we come here, we make our first cut. We go from the top of this cut, 19 inches over, draw a line, and then we're gonna cut diagonally right there. So that, how all the angles work out, um, since we're taking a half inch off of each side, essentially that 19 becomes 18, and we can line it up and stack it like that. Now those are just gonna be uh, held in by wood glue, um, nothing more. So I'll go ahead and uh, do the rest. I've done a few, you can see them over there. And then uh, let me just show you real quick why I use those pocket screws. Um, it made everything go in super, super easily uh, and level. And then 
for these two by twos especially, having tried to do just the conventional um, kind of screw from maybe this side in, it would have cracked definitely this piece, maybe even this piece. Um, so these pocket hole screws went in like butter, didn't have any issues there. Um, yeah, and that's kind of all I got for right now. Uh, you can see more of them all up there. And then these are just gonna be held in by wood glue. And then the last thing, since I've talked to you guys a few times about using two by fours and it not being perfect. So when you joint a two two by fours together uh, like this here, you can see you've got this big kind of ugly gap and, and that'll probably, uh, well, it'll stay, <laughs> I mean, obviously. Um, so what I did, and I'm trying to just kind of trick the eye, is I filled the seams here with wood filler and then I'll come back in a little while and sand them down to be a little bit more even. Um, so that hopefully it's not as noticeable. And after I glue these in with wood glue, I'll come back and do the same on all of those seams and, and hopefully we'll call it good. So let's keep cutting the rest of the pieces. All right, so I've got two of these made, each corner here. I took the slats out of this one here because uh, I'm about to glue them down. But uh, here's what that sanded wood filler looks like on top of the pocket hole screws. So they're what they look like without in the corner there and then there, um, and I did that because there's not gonna be a piece of wood covering it like there will be for these and those, so I want it to look smooth. As for the other wood filler that I did, I'm not gonna say it didn't work, it just needs more, and I don't know if I feel like putting the time, because this one you can definitely still see the joint. This one you can still see the joint, there's some areas where it's better, um, and then some worked really, really well. Uh, well, maybe not, but <laughs> either way, um, it's definitely doable. I just don't know if I feel like doing it. Um, so more to follow, but I went ahead and got an Aspen edge glued, just cuts for the top of the board. Um, or not the top, the, uh, shelves down there. And then the top piece, which will be five feet long, will be another piece of Aspen that I'll stain just like I'll stain these. So it's kind of like an accent color that goes together. So this one's uh, 24 by... 48, I believe, um, so two feet by four feet. And I'll just cut two pieces to put right in here. So these aren't exactly, exactly square, definitely not as square as I'd like them. So I'm gonna take individual measurements for each side and then transfer them over to the board and hopefully it lines up pretty well. And then I gotta cut these bad boys out so that it fits in there pretty nice. And I'm gonna have to go a little bit, maybe an inch, maybe more, inch and a half out from the four by four here, which is the reason I had to put wood filler in there because uh, otherwise that slat that comes up at an angle, it rests right in there. And so my flat table won't be able to sit right there. So I'll show you what I mean once I do it. All right, so I'm not gonna lie to you and tell you that this came out really well. But it's not, not terrible. My biggest mistake was I incorrectly measured those by about a quarter of an inch. So if you can see about a quarter of an inch off on each side. Uh, that was unfortunate. Over here, I trimmed too much off when I was trying to get it to fit better. This is more the fit that I wanted, and then I made a mistake not paying attention there. So, uh, huge learning experience doing this. Um, it's okay. Uh, this one should come out much better, and I'm just gonna show you how I'm doing this. So I cut the piece of wood uh, to the right size that I needed based on how unsquare those were, but it's fine. Um, and then I just kind of took measurements and drew with a square where I needed to cut. And then I've just rotated it around the table saw to get each cut since I have to use both sides of my table saw. Um, it's really my first time using a table saw in a big setting like this. It does work better than a circular saw for sure. Um, my biggest piece of advice is just make sure to always have the piece that you want facing up, uh, facing up quite literally, because the cuts <clears throat> that the circular saw makes or that the table saw makes come a lot further on the underside. It's just how the angle of the blade is here. So if you cut it with the other side up, you're going to get, when you, when you flip it back over, you're going you're to have your cut out and then you're going to have cuts coming further in. So um, maybe I'll show you that after I'm done here, but yeah, let's finish up. So just to show you what I mean, you can see where those cross cuts came in uh, even more. You know what? I probably could have used the miter saw for this, but Oh well, it's done now. Um, but that's the underside. So it looks a lot better. Let me go ahead and put this in and we'll see if it was cut correctly.
Okay, so I'm back from deployment and working on the desk again. So I got the six foot piece of edge glued Aspen, just like I have down on the bottom there. Um, and I've gone ahead and I cut these channels <clears throat> that I bought for the LEDs for the uh, diffusers. And uh, what we're gonna do is we've taped it down so that it's square and it's where we want it on the board. So we're gonna trace it out and then I'm going to use a router that I just bought to try to cut the groove a quarter inch deep and a half inch wide, which I'm pretty sure is the width of these little channels. <clears throat> so we will see how that goes. All right, what's up guys? So after a very frustrating first attempt, we've got two straight lines in the desk here for the LED channel. Um, so a lot, a lot of lessons learned um with using a router especially it being the first time so the first thing we did was i switched the bits out um after practicing and so i had a um shoot maybe it was a quarter inch maybe half inch um straight piece cut there bit at the end but the led channels the little diffuser channels i had bought were five eighths um width so I got a 5 8 width uh, bit, and this is what it looks like. And so ideally, it should fit the, diff the diffuser channel right inside of there. Um, it doesn't. It's just a little bit too thin. So after we made our first line, um, which wasn't great, but it was maybe straight enough, um, we went ahead and tried to widen it just a little bit, and I made, like, the rookiest mistake ever. <laughs> I clamped my piece of wood down on each side of the desk here so that I could keep the router straight against the flat edge here as I moved it. And this side was about four inches uh, wide. And then this side down here was like three and three quarters. So obviously the board was slanted. And so I should have measured twice and I didn't. And so as I started routing to make it a little bit wider, as I got to about halfway through the middle of the board, I realized that the middle channel here was now almost double the width because as I slid it, it just kept widening. So that was really, really frustrating. I quit. <laughs> Steph witnessed everything, kicked the desk maybe. I was really mad um, and we took a break, went and did some other things. And then we came back and uh, I told Steph it was gonna bother me if I didn't do it and finish it tonight. And so, we came up with a new plan. So some wins here, uh, I've learned a lot, like I said, and so the biggest piece of advice I've got uh, is one, once you know which direction to route in, uh, and maybe I'll, I'll make a video about that someday, or you can just watch it on YouTube. If you don't push the router in the right direction, uh, according to what direction that bit itself is spinning, you'll lose it. It'll just like run away and it won't follow any straight edge, it'll just do lines. Um, I wish I had a piece I could show you, but I don't right now. So anyways, um, once you're moving in the right direction, <clears throat> if you're using a piece of wood as a straight edge and not like a metal clamp, and I had to use a piece of wood because this is a really long desk. And so I didn't have like a six foot metal clamp. That's like 70 bucks probably. Um, anyways, <clears throat> so I was using a two by four. And if you look at two by fours, especially ones you just pick up at a hardware, hardware store, if you haven't planed it to make it exactly square, the edges are round. Um, and so as you lay it flat so that you can run your flat edge of your router against it, you can kind of see here, but there's a little lip just right there. And as you push uh, in the direction that the router needs to be moving, that lip will catch that rounded edge of the two by four. And God, like it just makes it impossible to push. You're, you're kind of, I'm putting all my strength into it to keep it most push it, pushing. And, um, it makes a really ugly cut. You'll see it in the channel itself along the wall. You can kind of see it here, but it's not nearly as bad as when I did it earlier with the two by four. It makes like waves because the edge isn't cutting well and you really see it on the underside. So what I did was I had this nice straighter piece of wood. I don't even know where I got it. This is really old scrap wood, but it's nice and square. And so there's nothing for that lip to catch. So that's like a really big piece of advice. Um, other than that, <clears throat> well, there's a lot more, but you'll just have to figure it out like I did. Um, 
Anyways, so another great idea that uh, Steph had and kind of a win for me was originally I had put those channels much closer to the edge of the board. And I did that without thinking, even though uh, I had thought about it months ago. Uh, so the problem is I started this desk when I, uh, before I deployed and had all these ideas and the plans out in my head. And then I came back and just kind of wanted to jump into it since I'm leaving here in a few days and uh, didn't really keep in mind all my plans. So <clears throat> because it was much closer to the edge, it was kind of sitting right on top of these two by fours and this four by four. And my like grandmaster plan here is to connect these two sides with another channel so it makes like a long rectangle, right? Um, all right, and then I'm gonna drill down a hole right through the top that's gonna go and, and you'll be able to reach down and grab any wires and that's how I'm gonna power the LEDs, right? Um, so they're gonna reach down here and the wires are gonna come through and I'll plug it in that way. Now, because I had done the channel originally right here, it would have gone straight into the four x four or two x four and I didn't really have a solution. I was just gonna kind of force one out. So this is actually a huge win that I don't have to do that. And I can go back to my original plan. Another thing we did was, I don't know why I didn't plan for this originally <clears throat> because it's 2021, almost 22, and we have great things like epoxy resin. So I was originally using these channels and that was a huge mess trying to get, uh, they're probably four feet out of the box to be six feet. Um, and so yeah, I had to cut them and, and just all this mess. And I didn't even think they were gonna line up and it's, it just would have been, sake so um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pour kind of opaque epoxy resin down into this channel um, and then we'll sand off you know whatever's not there uh, whatever spills over and uh, the LED strip will be underneath it and so it'll kind of give it like a nice diffused opaque look is which is what I was going for to begin with and uh, yeah it'll just hopefully work out better and it'll be more flush with the desk I've never used epoxy resin before, uh, so I've got a lot to learn on that. I'll probably have to practice with that stuff just like I did with this router because I don't want to redo this again. Um, I've used epoxy on my garage floor. You can see it here, that's why it's shiny. It's a little bit different type of epoxy, but kind of same principle. You move, you mix part A and part B together, and then it's got a pot life and a cure time, and you mix pigment in just like I did here to get the metallic look. So uh, that's the plan, but just on a much smaller scale here. So I figure if I could do it and cover an entire three car garage without messing it up too badly, I can do it with this. And so I'll, I'll cue you guys in on that. Unfortunately, that'll have to wait two, two and a half weeks until I get back uh, to the house here after we get back from Christmas uh, vacation down with our families. So more to come on that, but uh, we'll go ahead and fin up, finish up this channel here and then let you know how it goes. All right, so as you saw in the last clip, I was cutting the uh, vertical channels there, and then it is done. So it went pretty smoothly. We really only have one mess up. It's right here. I went a little too far, and so it made a little bit of a divot in the channel, but the rest of the corners look nice and uh, smooth. You got all this kind of garbage on the top right here, and then you can see it's a little bit different height, um, but the garbage will get cleaned off when I take my orbital sander to the whole top here like I do before I uh, stain and polyurethane coat everything, which will get these pencil marks off too. Um, that's what we drew so we knew where to stop. Um, so it should clean up nicely. And then the height difference there, it doesn't matter when you're pouring epoxy resin because the epoxy is just gonna fill up all the gaps. So that's the plan. It's kind of funny right now when you look at it because it really just looks like I made a door and then, <laughs> or bought a door and then put it on top of my desk. But once we have the epoxy in there, it'll look nice and uh, flush again. 
and then the LEDs will be in there and it'll look real neat. So I wanted to show you two, um, like I was talking about with the practice board here. So I did this line uh, first. This was like where I learned to use the router um, on just a piece of scrap wood that I had. This is pine, edge glued pine. This is edge glued aspen. So it's kind of similar, different woods obviously, and that does affect it. I couldn't tell you how. I just heard that it does and I believe it after cutting both pieces of wood here. Um, there's a little bit of stain on it, so that's why it looks off color. But anyways, so I did this one with, uh, there you go, let it focus, with two passes of a smaller bit, a thinner bit. So I had to go once and it made kind of a thin line and then I came back and did another one. And as you can see, one I was learning, so it's like jagged and right here, if you're not careful with the router direction or uh, things like that, it'll chip the surface. And so that's obviously not uh, ideal. So then I bought the new bit, the wider one, and I just ran a random pass, no straight edge or anything like that, just to see how it cut and it cut pretty good. So I liked it. Um, and then this is what I want to tell you about cutting in the wrong bit direction. So at first I was just doing a, a small line to see if the channels would fit. And then I decided I'd go all the way through um, and try to slide a, a, a full channel in there um, when I was using those metal channers, channels. So I came out uh, to here and then I took the router and I tried to come in from this way and it was going in the same direction as the bit. And so that's called a climb cut and that's not what you want. And as I touched the wood here and started cutting in, it was cutting fine. And then all of a sudden, uh, because I was going with the, the bit direction, it, like I said, it got away from me and it just sped up and did this huge line cut. Uh, obviously no big deal because it's my practice board and I was learning, but that showed me. And there's all kinds of pictures you can look up online about telling you which direction to cut and a, a right hand rule with your thumb. And there's all kinds of things like that. Uh, just work your way through it. Always practice before you cut and you'll figure it out. But it is really important to make sure you cut in the direction of the bit. And so until we get back and pour that epoxy in there, uh, the tabletop is done for now. All right, so we started painting. Actually, we just finished painting. So that's big. Took a really, really long time. Um, we painted the frame of the desk, except for the parts that are gonna be covered by wood. So that's why you can see some of those pocket hole screws down on the bottom. And then the, obviously the top isn't painted because the tabletop will be over it. Um, took a while because we had to do these slats individually and then flip them over once they had dried and do that again. The ones that are already in there, we started earlier, so they're fully dry. They're not fully, but enough to work with. Um, good thing we did this because we realized we're going to have to stain and poly the little shelves at the bottom there and put them in first. And then we can put in all the slats and glue everything in. Uh, which is how I'm going to hold the slats into place. And then the last thing we'll do is the tabletop. So that'll be back when we get back from uh, Christmas there. A couple uh, tips, since I always have tips when I come back in these clips. So for about half of these slats, looks like on the right side of the desk there, I went ahead and sanded 120 grit, 200 grit. I might have stopped at 200 grit. The uh, two by four slats down. And it took a long time. I used my orbital sander but it made a world of a difference when actually painting because it's smooth, so the paint goes on real smooth. Whereas these pieces, <clears throat> you can see they're a little bit more rigid. Uh, the paint will dry, so it won't look tacky like it does now. It's just wet, um, and I'll talk about that in a second. But it's a lot more rigid, whereas the pieces that I sanded <clears throat> are a lot smoother. Uh, it won't matter too much when it's kind of all put together because that paint makes it look really pretty smooth, but um, it definitely made it more difficult painting. All right, last piece of advice before I dip will be <clears throat> to use a paint like this. I just picked it up at my local hardware store, found a paint swab that I liked. Um, it looks a lot blacker in here right now because I've got the door shut and the uh, yellow light is kind of shining on it instead of sunlight, which it looks a little bit grayer. Um, but anyways, I picked a paint swab, got a pint, uh, which is plenty, it might be a quart actually, it's a quart, which is plenty. I did a, another project with this and then this project, which is a lot of paint and it's still got paint in it. <clears throat> so anyways, um, oh, I'm just seeing something we, we forgot. <laughs> you can see it right in the middle of that desk there. So we'll, we'll probably touch that up later. Um, so anyways, this paint is really nice because it's a one coat, one coat paint plus primer. And so what that means is I didn't have to prime any of these pieces before I applied the paint. 
and it's a really, really thick paint. So you kind of just need to go over it once with like a, you know, one good stroke, kind of glob it on there and then uh, paint over it. And you don't need to do a second coat. It goes on really thick and it looks ratchet when you put it on because it looks dobby and uh, clumpy, but the paint does a really, really good job of kind of settling and you see that there as it dries and so it looks nice, smooth and flat. So <clears throat> pay a little bit extra for the Paint Plus Primer and one coat. They have a three coat option, a two coat option, and then the one coat. And it really wasn't that much extra. That probably cost me $25 and I've used it on two projects now. So anyways, that's it for painting and I'll put the rest of the slats in there later today and we'll call it until we get back in a few weeks. All right, so here's what we've got so far. Um, we're heading out tomorrow, so we won't be able to finish it till we get back, but we're in a really good stopping point here. We'll have to touch up a few areas with the paint where it didn't get a thick enough coat on, but that's okay. Uh, pretty easy fix there, and so we will continue to work on it when we get back. Uh, all that we really have left to do here is stain the bottom two shelves, uh, stain the top portion there, add the coats of polyurethane to give it that high gloss finish that I love, and to protect it. And then we'll route our LEDs through uh, the bottom portion channel here and then fill it with resin and uh, prepare the surface after that's done to sand it down, everything like that for the stain and poly. And then I'm going to drill a two inch uh, hole using a hole saw here um, for a grommet where I can run wires through so I can hide all my wires on the inside of the desk there. So uh, yeah, that's pretty much it for now. Um, I really love how it's come out so far. It looks really clean and it kind of looks awkward right now because we got that real white wood on the bottom and on the top there, but it's gonna be a nice dark color uh, stain. Um, well, not too dark, but kind of like a light pine. It'll look really pretty, just trust me there. But uh, yeah, so we'll see when we get back. All right, well for you guys, that was about two seconds. For me, it's been about two and a half, three weeks, um, but I'm back. <clears throat> so we're gonna start working on the desk again. I got a lot of supplies in while I was gone, uh, a lot of trials and errors. Um, but anyways, I'll go through those in a bit with the LEDs, but I think I found a solution. So what I'm gonna do now is I just uh, tested out our hole saw <clears throat> right here. It's still got the chunk of wood in there because it's freaking hot and I didn't want to grab it out. But that's the hole that the grommet's gonna go in. You can see my grommet's laying over there. But it fits really nicely with some wood glue. It'll be real tight. Um, so anyways, that's that's good. That works. I tested it. Always test it first is my uh, my advice. And so I just clamped an old 2x4 down and then went through it. Uh, easier than I thought, honestly, because I, I realized as I started to do it, I was like, man, this is a 2-inch thick piece of wood. It's kind of going to be a, a pain in the butt. So um, originally, <clears throat> I had planned to just put one hole right here somewhere. Um, which might give me a bit of a problem because of the 2x4 that I put on the underside of this. So we'll, we'll play around with that and see what happens. Um, yeah, kind of going through some things in my head as I talk to you about it. But anyways, so I was just going to put one for the cables from the monitors. But then Steph, over Christmas, got me some Razer Nomo speakers, which are really cool. And they'll look really good on the desk. But that meant I had more wires on the desk than I anticipated. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a grommet here and then likewise on the other side. I have five of them, so that's not a problem, and they still look clean, so that's good. So we're going to do that while I wait on my drill battery to charge up, because uh, it takes a lot of power to go through that thing. Um, I'm going to go ahead and sand out this channel, make it real nice and smooth, so I can put my, my LEDs tonight, and then hopefully fill it with epoxy overnight. Uh, yeah, man, so let's just see what happens. All right, so uh, this project is definitely more uh, challenging. Uh, I guess, I guess my ambitions are challenging. <clears throat> I think that's what I came with, came up with wanting to say. Um, so a little, little bit frustrating, but some, some updates here. So I'm just gonna point this out. <clears throat> I messed up, of course, went a little too far with the router. So. Uh, you know, I'm pretty OCD and I like to be a perfectionist and I like things done as well as I know they can be, even if it's a little bit above my skill level currently, you know, that's how, that's how improving is done. You have to make mistakes and learn from them. So, uh, that's what we're doing and I'm just going to have to be okay with some imperfections on this desk. But, um, so the reason we're having to do this 
is I went ahead and I cut the hole to drop the LED wires through. And then when I tried to run them through the channel here before sending the epoxy in, trying that tonight, I wanted to originally lay the LEDs down flat <clears throat> and then just have them go around. But I think I knew this wouldn't work and I was just banking on some miracle. But they're like too thick to wrap around this corner, essentially. Like, um, I'll show you when I, when I go to put them in finally. But uh, so anyways, that's that's kind of a mistake or not a mistake, but just a problem. And so what I came up with doing is I'm going to lay them flat against this edge so they kind of shine towards the other edge. And so to do that, I had to deepen this channel by about another quarter of an inch so that the LEDs can run along that because it's just not deep enough here. So having to reroute everything, which is a huge pain in the butt and a big risk, uh, I mean, it just is because that's how accidents like this happen. It's really hard to get the router in the same exact spot so that's the current update and uh, i'm gonna finish routing the rest of this tabletop and get back to you all right so we're done and as bob ross always says there are no mistakes just happy accidents uh so like these areas you know i kind of sanded them down made them not so noticeable although i'm sure they'll be super noticeable when i fill it with epoxy anyways um so we got the channel deep enough now it's about a Shoot, man, probably almost a half inch deep. You can really see it there. So now we've got to run the LEDs. So we're gonna get going on that. Uh, something I realized while making mistakes, of course, is that the center of the desk here in the front where I sit, I don't know if you can see that, but it's super pliable. Uh, I don't know if it's now because I've just gouged out half an inch of the structure of this wood. And so it's not as sturdy, but it's just like you can press down on it and feel it move. And I don't like that. Um, so I, I wasn't going to do it, but now I'm going to do it. I'm going to put a two by four running from four by or two by four to two by four here and just give it some more support. So I'll use some pocket hole screws to do that. So we'll do that before, uh, before we do much more. But right now I'm going to lay down the LEDs and then get the uh, epoxy set in there tonight, I think which, you know, could be a huge mistake. All right, see you guys in a bit. All right, so the LEDs are in and they work. So now we just have to fill it with epoxy, but uh, I'm gonna show you guys how I did this because it was like the most frustrating part for me when I was trying to find YouTube videos on how to do this or look for examples. Um, no one really gave a good explanation. So I've got my channel dug out here. I put my hole like you saw earlier. And then we, uh, we ran the LEDs on the outside and just put hot glue every couple lengths because these are really going to be held in place with hot glue. Uh, I'm sorry, with uh, epoxy. So they just needed to stay uh, glued in while the epoxy set so they don't float up. Um, and the channel was deep enough so that they're not even flush with the edge. They're a little bit further down. There's about an eighth of an inch, maybe a, maybe a millimeter or two difference. So that'll be good. Um, I'm not going to show you all the cool things that the LEDs can do right now because, uh, to be honest, I want to wait for the finished product. So uh, one last thing is we had to, you know, we had some excess. You can only cut these every five or six inches or so. And so with the excess, instead of running it over this end because of the, the things that it can do with the, the colors and addressable RB, RGBs and all that, um, I just looped it around. And so... Last thing before we fill it with epoxy, if you haven't used epoxy before like me, but you know some tips and tricks about it, <clears throat> epoxy is a mess if it gets anywhere except for where you're trying to put it. And I'm doing this inside and I'll explain that in a minute. But uh, so to fill this hole, I need to put hot glue all in there so that it's like, you know, watertight essentially so that the epoxy doesn't come through. So we're going to do that and um, we'll try that tonight and see how it goes. All right. So here we are inside with the epoxy um gumbo and stephanus say hello uh so i'm using total boat high performance epoxy resin i got a quart of it and fast hardener hopefully it's enough and then i got this color of pigment to make it kind of a opaque white um with a little bit of a pearl so i think that'll be pretty neat it gives you the kit and everything you need to know to mix it so we're gonna work on that the house is a mess right now because steph just moved in <laughs> and we're 
not cleaning up very well. So you might think I'm crazy because I have this in the house, but I do it for two reasons. The first, the most important, is that we're in uh, Kansas in the middle of January, and it's freaking freezing cold outside, and Gumbo's going to help. And uh, you need to really work this epoxy between 50 and 90 degrees Celsius, 70-ish, to be perfect. And it just so happens that this house is 72 degrees right now, so that's perfect. Um, otherwise, it doesn't cure correctly. And the second reason is that you need a really level mm -hmm. surface. I think Total Boat is pretty viscous, um, or, or it's got a low viscosity, so it doesn't, like, spread quickly. It's kind of like honey instead of, like, water. Uh, which is really good if you have mistakes or if the surface isn't level. Um, but you want it to be level so that it spreads evenly. But if you're working on a surface that's not level and you've got a really high viscosity or whichever way, flip-flop that. It's been a while since I was in school. Um, epoxy resin and it's not level, it'll just like run and spill. And if you make a mess with epoxy, your life is over. Which I'm hoping we don't do today. Uh, so I've got a tarp down there and hopefully that prevents ruining something in this house. So we're really just gonna give it a go. I've done like all the research I can and uh, I hope I know enough to do this correctly. Um, but you know, as this project has taught me, you can make a ton of mistakes and still keep going. So yeah. All right, my phone's gonna die shortly here. <clears throat> so I'll just go over what we did. We finished the epoxy pour, probably did a lot of things incorrectly. Uh, the first thing we did incorrectly was we filled like half a quart worth of uh man i don't even know it was a lot filled half a cup like a big cup almost a bucket small bucket <laughs> uh full of epoxy mixed the pigment in and then started to pour it by the time i got to like that corner i started in that one by the time i got to that one the thing was smoking hot in my hand i mean like really hot and then when i got to the very final pour of that bucket it um it like got hard instantly. So we did something very wrong and I had to like throw it out of that door because it was literally smoking in my hand. I think it melted the cup a little bit. So that was a big, big loss. Um, and then I didn't think we'd have enough epoxy to finish, but what we did was we just started mixing small amounts of epoxy uh, in the same cup over and over, mixing pigment in and then doing kind of layer by layer. Did that five or six times. Um, still, I think we did it too quickly. I think we should have been a little bit I should have been a little bit more patient because in some areas where the pour got pretty thick it started to like smoke and steam which means the layer is too thick and the reaction isn't going right and like that's kind of evident in areas like this where you can see like there's layers overlapping because this like hardened really quickly so it didn't get to pour and like kind of smooth self level itself so we'll see how much of that comes out in um sanding when I sand down the table uh that's why it kind of looks like gunky like in areas where I overfilled it because epoxy kind of shrinks as it cures and so like kind of here it's not super flush there's still a little bit of the edge of the wood that you can feel but I think a lot of that'll come out when I sand it um but I mean like overall it's it's it came out decently for like our first time not really knowing what we're doing with epoxy uh I don't recommend doing it in your house it was a mess clearly I'm glad I had a tarp glad I had two people um, it was just a huge mess. The color pigment, the powder is like crazy fine particles and it just, that can't be good. It, it's just like in the air everywhere. So that was just a mess, but I think it kind of looks cool. The like pearlescent effect, uh, like this crazy gunky run hopefully will come out in, in sanding. And if it doesn't, oh, well, Steph said it best. Everything is adding a lot of character to this desk, so <laughs> we'll see. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'll keep you updated when we sand it and show you the final product, what it looks like. Uh, the LEDs still do work, so that's a solution if you want to inlay LEDs, this works. Um, yeah, Steph wants me to mention the heat gun that we tried to use, uh, kind of like a blowtorch. They say to get air bubbles out. It didn't really work. As you can see, like right there there's an air bubble that came out and it's just not going to get filled there's like three right there and that's really the only ones in the desk but whatever character um i don't know i don't think it worked because i don't really understand that whole process because epoxy how it works is the two parts mix and there's a chemical reaction that's happening and so that's giving off heat that's what chemical reactions do and so adding more heat to that just made it worse I don't, I don't really understand. 
Um, I probably not, clearly, I'm sure we were doing something incorrectly, but for first time users, maybe just live with the bubbles. I don't know, but we'll show you what it looks like when we get sanded down. All right, cleaned up the space a good bit. Now it's time to start sanding and staining and putting poly on all of these pieces here so that I can start assembling the desk. We're almost done. I did add that crossbar support underneath the tabletop, which I'll show you when I remove that tarp. Put that tarp down because I'm about to start sanding that epoxy in the wood and sawdust and acrylic is gonna get everywhere. So that'll just help keep it off the gray painted pieces. I can wipe it all down with a rag and I will when I'm done. Um, so I'm gonna sand everything, get it where it needs to be sanding wise, and then I'm gonna clean up this floor uh, and kind of the area so that it's pretty sterile in here when I go to paint and stain everything so that I don't get any pieces of wood dust and acrylic in the stain. So yeah, more to come on that. Um, what are some things, some notes. Found out the desk doesn't fit through the hallways of my house. So I'm gonna have to put it in my room through a window. Huge mess. More on that when we actually do it because that's gonna be hilarious. And my dad's gonna kick me. It's the second time I've done this for the desk. Not measured properly. So we'll talk about that. Um, <clears throat> the LEDs still, still do work. I don't know if I took a video of that or not in the LEDs in the epoxy. So that's really cool that that worked out. Um, and we're going to see if we can make this epoxy look a little bit better with the sanding. So let me lay everything out and I'll show you how I'm going to do this. All right. So that's what I'm going to do. First off, safety, uh, random or not random. Sorry, I almost said random orbital sander, uh, aspirator, um, because I'm going to be sanding down acrylic epoxy and man, it's going to get everywhere. And I don't think that stuff is safe to breathe in. Um, so get a nice aspirator, 30 bucks, whatever. Um, safety glasses, probably should wear goggles, but hopefully glasses will be okay. I'm going to start with 60 grit coarse, uh, sandpaper, my random orbital sander, bump it up to 80, 120, 220, and I'll finish with hand sanding it with 400. Um, on those, I'll just do my standard, uh, maybe, maybe 80 grit and then go to 120, 220, 400. Um, we don't know if this is going to work. Uh... The real way to get this nice, even, and flat, even before I sand it, is to throw it through a planer and cut, you know, an eighth of an inch off, whatever I need to, to get everything nice, smooth, and even. But uh, I don't have a planer that big, and I don't know where to get one. So hopefully sanding works. Um, it's not too bad, but we got these areas where the overflow is pretty significant. So, I, I, you know, I don't know. I've never tried to sand epoxy. I know that it, it gets done, so hopefully I can take large amounts off like that or it's just going to be a nightmare and it's not going to work so uh only one way to find out is to do it um and that's that uh, i don't think i have anything else for you so i'm gonna get to it all right so i'm about halfway done with the 60 grit um it's actually working really freaking well it's actually pretty impressive um so i've done kind of that uh half of it and I'm gonna show you here. So if you if you remember, maybe I'll put like side by side images. I don't I don't know, but this was really overflowing and uh, kind of just gunky looking. And so you sand it down, it gets flush. I mean, it's very flush. Uh, it's really really neat. Um, I'm not sure if this like scuff will come out. I'm pretty sure it does because people sand epoxy all the time. Maybe I have to use some type of oil. So I'll look into that. But it, I mean, it look it works really really well, and it looks a lot better. Like. You can just kind of see like that, there's that line there, and then you've got this line. It looks a lot cleaner. It looks like what the router channels originally looked like. Um, so just some some tips for you. Uh, you want a real, you kind of know you're, you're done with a section and it's flush. And remember, this is just 60 grit, so I gotta hit it with 80, 120, and 220 as well, so it's gonna get a lot more refined. Um, when you got an even uh, scuff around it. So like this area might need a little bit more because it's still kind of shiny right here at the bottom and towards the edges. So the middle part is a little bit higher. It's very hard to tell because it's pretty flat when I run my finger over it, but that's a real good way to know that you're flush. Um, be patient. It takes a lot of time to go and knock all that off, um, knock it down to be flush. So just kind of spend, you know, a few minutes on each section 
going back and forth in maybe five to six inch lines and you'll eventually knock it all down. Um, you can see where the epoxy's on the wood, like right here and it overspilled, you get that sheen. Um, that's how you know the epoxy is still on the wood and not uh, eaten off and, and flush. So as you can see along these edges, there's no sheen. It's very flat because it's just wood. Um, and it's, it's, it's soft like wood, not kind of smooth and hard like epoxy. So that's a real good way to know. Um, I've actually found that it's easier to knock off overfill. So when you do this and you fill it on your own, maybe be a little bit generous and, and get it kind of like this area where it's just a little bit of overflow and not a whole lot. Um, because in this area down here, right about here, um, it was underfilled and it took a lot of sanding to knock the wood down low enough to be even with the epoxy. Uh, but if you can remember, I had, I had poured a little towards the end of the pot life of one batch and there was like an overlap, like a layer on top of another layer and it hardened and it wasn't viscous enough to kind of self level itself. Well, that comes right out with the, uh, the sanding. So that's really, really neat to see that it gets it all even finished. Um, I had gouged the wood with my router that came out with the 60, um, grit sandpaper. So now we got a nice flat surface again, which is really nice. So I'm going to keep knocking all this out here and you'll see at the end that it, it gets smooth, you know, so, uh, good progress and, and really, really neat, really, really happy with the way this is turning out. And, uh, it's cool. All right. So coming to you a little bit later <clears throat> after I have, I cleaned up the garage real good because I knew I was going to be staining and, uh, poly coating, uh, the tabletops and so you want as sterile of an environment as you can get and I mean I'm in a workshop slash garage so it's not gonna be perfect but I got a lot of the sawdust and things like that from sanding down um, so yeah that's important and then as you can see I taped off on the big tabletop here the the uh, resin because I just couldn't find a real solid answer on whether or not you should put stain over epoxy I think my resounding conclusion was that stain won't stick to epoxy because it's like plastic so you probably could just wipe it off right after but i've worked too hard on that resin pour channel led thing to make it golden pecan so i just went ahead and did the safe bet and taped it off and I'll, I'll tape off the other section once i go to stain the outside edge there but this is just one coat of uh, a golden pecan color uh, it's pretty light which is interesting and a little bit reddish uh, it kind of changes with the way you look at it. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to do two coats yet. I'll give it some some thought. I've got two hours to think about it. So uh, we'll see. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a pretty color. Maybe not exactly the color, uh, color I was going for. I want more of a, a golden uh, look. And this is just a little bit more reddish brown. So, I mean, right now, actually, like looking through the iPhone screen, it looks very golden. Um, but looking in person, it's a little bit more red. So... We'll see what we do with that, and poly always kind of gives it an interesting color too. Uh, if you don't know this already, different types of wood take stains differently, meaning the color is going to be different. So this is the second time that this has kind of happened to me. Um, I did a dresser and nightstand set for my guest bedroom, and one tabletop was oak, and the other one was like cherry i want to say it had a real red color so that's what makes me think it was cherry and they look completely different um with the stain on them still look good but just look different so i had done a piece with pine tabletops and i love the golden pecan on that really brought out the gold in the pine and um this is a little bit different so we will see all right, <clears throat> so we're in the final stages of this beast. We're going to add the top coat of polyurethane clear gloss. I do five top coats on all my wooden tabletops. Uh, three is enough. It'll get you a nice finish that'll keep you protected for a long time. But I find four and five, those layers are really where you kind of make your money and you get a real nice glassy tabletop finish, which you'll see. Once it's done, I'll show you at three, and then I'll show you at five, so that you can see the difference. Uh, there's some special techniques I use, so before I start, I go through with a microfiber cloth just one more time and get any dust that might have settled over the last few days off the tabletops. 
that works pretty well. And then I'll add my first coat of polyurethane. Uh, you don't do it too, too thickly, but not too thin either. And once you do that first coat uh, and every coat in between, so it's a little different than stain. Stain, you wait two hours between coats. On polyurethane, you wait four. So it does take a long time to do five. It usually takes about uh, 24 hours, 20 really, if you think about it. Um, so there's some getting up in the middle of the night if you start it in the middle of the day. Um, it's fine though, I don't mind. It takes about 10 minutes to uh, add a poly coat. But what you'll do is you'll add the first coat and then once it dries for four hours, you'll take some 400 grit sandpaper and just very lightly run it over the top. I'll show you when I do it. Um, and then you take another microfiber cloth and wipe all that dust that you've created off. Um, and that's getting any litty, little bubbles or imperfections out of the layer out before you add the next layer. And that's really important because any of those imperfections are gonna like stay trapped in there and just kind of compound on themselves as you add more and more layers to where the final product is a little bit more bumpy and grainy than you might want it to be. So it's a real simple step that goes a really long way. Um, so that's what I'm gonna do. I let this stain dry much longer than I've ever let dry before, uh, which is good. I found previously that if I just wait the four hours that stain recommends after you apply it, when you add that first layer of polyurethane, it kind of mixes in with the poly, and I don't love that. Um, it's really not that big of a deal, but I just try to avoid it, so uh, hopefully this works a little bit better. It's kind of being, uh, I don't know what the word is, it's kind of useless, I'll just put it that way, because I think my poly already has some stain mixed into it from previous projects. But it's the same stain, uh, this golden pecan, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, but yeah, I think it came out really great. Uh, another note I wanted to add something. I know I talked to you guys about uh, how to deal with your resin as you stain the wood, like taping over it, whatever, like I did. Um, that tape wasn't perfect and some stain, just, I mean barely any, but some stain leaked onto the epoxy and you would see like little spills, it looks like, um, on the epoxy once you remove the tape. So this may, and I'm saying may, strong may here work if you were to just apply stain over the entire piece. Uh, I think it would be a lot more work than just putting tape down, spending five minutes doing that. But basically, I just once the stain was done, I went back with some 200 grit sandpaper and uh, just kind of sanded over the epoxy real lightly where those stains were and it came up in seconds. So I think that worked really easily. One, because there wasn't a lot. It was just like a few spots, especially in these kind of irregular corners where I had messed up with the router. Um, and then two, because, uh, well, it wasn't a lot, you know, it's just, it's just a few drops. So if I had to do that for the whole piece, I, it would have taken a lot longer and, uh, you know, it might have come out well, but you run the risk when you do that of kind of bleeding over and sanding some of the stained area and you don't want to do that. So uh, I think my method was pretty good. You tape it down and then you just uh, stain whatever mistakes you have. Another really effective method, which a lot of people use, I just didn't want to use it for this wood. If I had had a nice piece of walnut or cherry, just some really nice wood with a lot of natural color to it, Aspen's very white, as you saw, um, you can just take like a, an oil and go over the whole piece and it'll really bring that color in the wood out and then you can epoxy over that and it'll keep it there. Um, and it also does wonders for your epoxy resin. It'll really make it shine and get some of the scuff out. Uh, so that's, you know, that's an option as well. Uh, not what I was looking for in this project, so I didn't do it. Walnut and cherry is also very expensive. So a little bit of extra work, and I achieved the end product that I wanted to. So time to add the poly. All right, so we are done with top coating. And um, yeah, this is kind of the final product of what the tabletops will look like. So you can see here, I got that nice kind of glassy, smooth surface, which is uh, what I like to say to Steph is my signature for furniture. Um, you can see the lights reflecting off there. Uh, probably did not come out as good as some of my previous tabletops. And I think that's kind of a combination of poor execution. I'm going to go ahead and take ownership of that. And then the weather. I think it's a little too cold for this stuff to dry properly. So it gets kind of gunky, maybe faster than it would. It doesn't dry properly. So some other things I didn't do real well in between coats was the sanding. Um, I went ahead and hit it with 220 grit. And uh, I didn't, I don't think I hit it hard enough in between coats. And really in like specifically in this area, um, you might not even be able to see it on camera. 
but it's a little bit more bumpy and there's some kind of dirt and debris or air bubbles. I don't know what it is inside of there, but to finish it off, I went ahead and hit it with 220 pretty hard. Uh, just again, hand sanding with a foam sander, a wrap 220 grit sandpaper around that foam sander and just went, you know, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, and then I hit it with 400 grit and that really smoothed it out. And then I took a micro microfiber cloth, wet it a little bit and picked up all that sand uh, sawdust off the top. You're not gonna hurt it. Um, I think I go back and forth pretty often between uh, sanding after the fifth layer of polyurethane and not sanding. This time I decided to do it mainly a lot because of those imperfections. Um, and just kind of risk the scuffing. And luckily it didn't happen. So I think because you're using such a high grit sandpaper at that point, 220 and 400, and if you really wanna play it safe, just do 400, you won't get any of that scuffing. So uh, that came out nicely. I've checked the LEDs, they still work. So that's exciting. And I'll show you those again, once I'm closer to being done. The other tabletop's over there because I'm about to start working on some other parts of the desk. But these are the, the, le the uh, little leg pieces. So pretty good. Um, they're in probably hour eight of the 24 hour kind of curing process for polyurethane. So, you know, by this time tomorrow, definitely they'll be complete and uh, pretty dry and it'll get better and, and harden up and look a little bit better. So a little bit tactile right now um, if you touch it, but it's nice and smooth. So um, that's exciting. Uh, other than that, we're just gonna keep cranking away at it and hopefully it'll be done pretty soon. All right, so this is what I'm working with my uh my office so far and uh we're gonna see how it looks after i get the new desk in here so i already took some of the wires off but you can just see the kind of rat's nest of wires that are coming out of the back of my desk here and uh that was kind of the big big motivation for me to change it i just hate seeing all these wires so we're gonna see if we can actually clean it up i've started packing away some of the pieces like the keyboard i got a new keyboard and I'm packing up my mouse mat right now. So we're just gonna take everything apart here so we can get the new desk in here and we'll go from there. Okay, and uh, this is how it finished out. So cleaned up the office a lot. Still gotta hang some pictures. I got some more stuff in my closet that I gotta put up on the opposite walls, like my uh, GT500 poster there, but we're here to talk about the desk. So yeah, this is, this is the finished product and I freaking love it, guys. I'm stoked with how it came out. I'm really proud of it, kind of like my first time designing my own piece of furniture, even though it's just a desk and running with it and seeing it through to the end. So uh, as you can see, it opened up a lot more space in the office too with the way I arranged things, which is great because I play some VR, so I've got a real good VR space there. Um, and then just the, the desk, I mean, I think it looks really good. The top coat looks really nice and that stain I chose with the gray. And then the wiring is a whole, whole lot better and it could even be better. And maybe uh, I'll clean it up a little bit more someday. But the biggest problem I ran into were my monitor cables. I've got uh, two HDMIs going from each monitor. And the HDMI that I used for my main monitor wasn't long enough to kind of wrap up this pole and then down uh, to the um, computer. And so I could just get maybe a foot longer, not even, and it would be perfect. So... You know, maybe one day I'll do that. And then this actually isn't the HDMI cord. It's the power cord. Um, and I don't know. <laughs> I don't really know how to fix that one. But I don't know. That's that's a later me problem. I was able to run the speaker cable all the way around the back of the desk here. So I'm really pumped with how it came out. I'll show you some of the features of the LEDs in just a second and the, the front. So that's how it looks. Um, like I said, man, I, I'm just, I love it. I think it came out great. Uh, this is the front. So to talk through some of the pieces here, I've got the two monitors that I had before. I've got the new Razer Nomo speakers, uh, the same Razer Kyo uh, webcam there. And then I had the Black Widow V2 Mercury Chroma before that was wired. And this is the Black Widow V3 wireless. Uh, I've got it plugged in right now because you can do some cooler lighting effects when it's plugged in like the fire. Uh, lighting effect that I really love on Razer products. And then I've got the Razer Naga Pro, which is also wireless. So completely wireless when I want it to be. Steph got me this super dope mouse pad. And that's embarrassing. Push this up and out of the way so we can see that. But um, 
Sorry, that's taking a little bit longer than I thought. But anyways, Steph got me a super dope mouse pad for Christmas, which I love. It's got its own individual LEDs that you control with the touchpad up there. And then it's my logo that I had just made prior to deploying, and I'm really proud of it. So I love having that on my desk. It's also my screensaver, um, but it gives me the freedom to change the screensaver and still have that incorporated into the desk. So I'm, I'm really, really happy with that. It's also a cool uh, wireless mouse pad, or not wireless, but mouse pad because it's got a wireless charger built in, which is something that I wanted to add to this desk, but just didn't didn't get ahead of doing. Um, so I think it's just a really neat piece to add to the desk here. Uh, so let me move this back so we can see the LEDs in just a second when I, when I play with them. But uh, yeah, I, I really, really like it. Um, I like my new components. I think they're pretty sweet. So that's that, got the same. GT, X-Man, whatever, <laughs> chair, and then my computer's down here. So some of the ways I did my cable management, computer's down here, and then if you can see, I went ahead and mounted two power strips. They've got USB power and then like four power outlets. I've mounted one here on this side of the desk and then one over on the left there. And uh, they're six foot cables, so I can just run it down the legs with some cable ties and then straight into the wall. And that just really allows me to plug things in down here and not have the wiring mess and zip ties and things like that. So let's take a look at some of the things that the LEDs can do. Hopefully it doesn't pause recording. So of course it won't let me record and use the app, which is how I control these. You can control them with Alexa and Google Home as well. So this is another one of the effects that the LEDs can do. Switch it to another one. This is another fun one. It's kind of like a marquee sign. Um, that's really neat and fun. This is another good one. The colors just kind of chase themselves around the desk. And then trailing, which maybe I already showed, but let me go ahead and turn the lights off and we can see how they look in the dark. This is what they look like in the dark and um, I'm really happy with it. So this definitely achieved the purpose that I was going for here with diffusing the lights and you can really tell where the diodes are at in the over the camera here and that's just because of how cameras work and they pick up light but it's a lot smoother uh in person and so uh yeah I'm, I'm really happy with how it came out it's cool that i've you know kind of accomplished this it's what i set out to do is inlay leds into the desk and have it be flush and another reason i want to do that is because if you're putting the desk against a wall you can just strap leds around the outside edge and use the wall and the reflection of light there to kind of diffuse your LEDs and you won't see those bright diodes in your face. But because I have this kind of sitting in the middle of the room, I couldn't do that without just getting blinded by LEDs anytime I walked into the, the room. So another point of doing that is if you go under the desk here, you can't see those LEDs, you know, a little tiny bit coming through the wood there where it's real thin because I had to deepen the channel, but they don't shine through. So it's not just this obnoxious glow of LED. And so uh, I'm really pumped about that. I, I really like that. Another super cool feature that these LEDs have that uh, I can't show, unfortunately, while I record, but I want you to know they have them, is it'll go to the beat of the music. And so I can play music over my computer or through my smartphone, whichever one, and they'll pulse or do all kinds of other cool effects to the beat of the music. And so that's just really neat, especially since I can do that with the keyboard, the Razer Nomo speakers and the mouse, like all together. And it just creates this really cool scene. So a uh, huge fan of these LEDs, huge fan of how everything came out. And so I know you guys have really sat through this super long video of me watching how to do this, but uh, I'm apparently stopping videos in the middle of recording them now. But uh, anyways, thanks for sitting through and watching this video. And if you didn't watch it all and just skip to the end, that's cool too. I'll link all the parts and everything that I used for this build in the description as expected. And uh, I hope you learned something from this and learn from some of my mistakes. I made a ton of them, but uh, you know, I'm happy to do it. And like I said, hopefully you guys took something away so that you can do this on your own and make your own project. And if you have any questions or want advice, leave a comment and I'm pretty good at responding. So uh, yeah, thanks guys. This has been Sterlis there. And as always, love putting these videos out for you guys. Subscribe.